Here's 11 command line mistakes that all new developers will make from time to time and how to fix them. So this first one is something we've all probably encountered before. You're trying to start up your API or app code and you get a message saying that the port number is already in use and whether you want to use a new port number but ideally you really don't want to use a new port as you might have some other local code like an app or an API that's relying on using that existing port. If you can find the command prompt where the existing app is running, then you can just stop it with Control C or whatever your shell's keyboard shortcut is and the port should be released. However, sometimes you might have so many prompts open that you can't find the windows to shut the existing app down or you can get a rogue process with the app still running which holds on to the port number. In this scenario, you have no way to close down the app to release the port so you end up just using the new port offered to you and you have to reconfigure all the other services that were already set up. But there's a way that you can find the elusive running process and close it down to release the port. First of all, use the list open files command to find the process that is using that port. This will give you some output that looks a little bit like this. Then you can just kill that process by using its PID to release the port. Or if you want to look like a total badass command line ninja, then you can just use the PID number from the result of the LSOF command and use it directly with the kill command. Now we should find we can start our app with our preferred port number. I don't want Windows users to feel left out here and there is indeed a similar set of commands that you can use on the regular command prompt in Windows to do the same thing. On your Windows machine, pull up your command prompt and use the netstat command piped into the find string command to get the process ID and then it's just a case of killing the command as we did before. You can see there are various different options that we're passing to these commands and it's important to know how to find out what these are and what they all mean. Okay, so it's pretty easy nowadays to look stuff up on the internet, but it's so much quicker to use some of the built-in help that's right there in front of you, if you know how to get to it, and look at it properly. For example, let's take a look at the SCP command, which is used for transferring files to a remote machine securely. If you just type the command in the command prompt, it will give you some usage info, but as you can see, it's not very helpful and we don't really know what all of those options mean. So we can use the man pages tool to get more info about how the SCP command works. But there's an even better way to find exactly what you're looking for. You can combine the output of man pages with search tools like grep to only return the specific things that you're interested in. For example, if we wanted to know how to recursively copy directories with SCP, we can use grep to find the option which lets us do this. Pro tip, use the dash i option when using grep to make your searches case insensitive to help you avoid missing things that otherwise might not have been picked up. The takeaway here is that you have lots of information right in front of you and you don't always need to look things up in Google. Of course, man pages doesn't work on the Windows command prompt, it just doesn't have that built in help like other command prompts do, so it's important to be aware of which environment you're working in and what capabilities it has. So it might seem pretty obvious which command prompt you are using or should be using depending on your operating system. If you're using Windows, you're using the command prompt or PowerShell. If you're using macOS or Linux, you're using Bash or ZSH or Fish or Dash or one of those. But for new developers, where the command line is still a bit scary, using a command not supported by the prompt you are in and getting an error can be confusing and frustrating. Bear in mind too that the command prompt you are using can change based on what you're doing, like if you're connected to a remote server, or you're using the git bash prompt or Ubuntu subsystem on Windows for example. So to clear up which command prompt you are actually using, you can run the following command, echo dollar zero. This will give you the current shell that you are using and help you diagnose why your previous command didn't work. Talking of previous commands, this leads us on to the next mistake new developers make. You should be able to go through the history of your commands that you've previously entered into the command prompt by using the up and down arrow keys. But if you're looking for a command that you used a while ago, then this might take a long time and you need to keep an eye on each command that's popping up, checking each one in turn. A better approach to this is to use the reverse I search tool by using Control R and then searching for the command that you're looking for. If you can't remember exactly what the command was, no problem, just partially type something in and then hit Control R again 
and you can cycle through any matches until you find what you're looking for. Let's move on and look at using a few different common commands and some things that new developers need to be aware of. You're probably familiar with the ls command to list files in a directory, but sometimes you might want to find out which files are taking up the most disk space in your project. Not too much of a problem if there are only a handful of files in the directory, we can just eyeball it, but what about if there are hundreds or thousands of files? Instead of manually searching through the list of files to pick out the large files, we can add some options to ls to do this for us. The l option is for a long listing, H is for human readable output to show things in kilobytes, megabytes and gigabytes etc. And the capital S option is for sorting by size order. So now we can see the largest files at the top of the listing output. We can also reverse this output to find the smallest files first if we want to. We can do the same thing for the most recently modified files by using the T option to sort by the time the file or directory was last updated. So from experience, I know this one is something that is a very painful lesson to learn. You basically have removed a file or even worse, a whole directory of work using the RM command. The good news is if you find yourself in this situation, I can save you a lot of time trying to find a solution. And the solution is don't bother wasting your time because there is no solution. Once you've removed your files with RM or RM-RF, then that's it, they're gone. So you need to be really careful when using this command and make sure you're using it in the right place. You can set an alias up so that the RM command is always run with the interactive option. So you have to confirm you're deleting the files you want. But of course that requires setting up in advance and is no good to you if you've already done the damage. That being said, there might be a couple of chances for you as a developer to reclaim your files. The first is dependent on your IDE, which may or may not provide a way for you to restore files from its history if you've removed them from the command line. The second is to restore your files from your changes in your Git repository on the assumption that you've already committed them. This should just be a case of unstaging the deleted files by checking out the recent changes from your local repository. And this is why it's definitely a good idea to be using Git with your code and committing regularly and also to make sure that you're committing your files properly. So this one is more of a Git problem than a specific command line issue, but lots of new developers don't set up their Git profile and repository settings in the correct way. The first thing to make sure you have set is your name and email. And then the next important thing to do is make sure you have ignored things that shouldn't be committed. For example, you can easily ignore the node modules folder in your app code by redirecting the output of echo into your git ignore file. Here's a few other examples of files that you might consider adding to your git ignore list. If you are going to use the output redirection operator, make sure you haven't already got something in your git ignore as this will overwrite what's already in there. Mistake number eight is a simple one, but it's important to know the difference between the output redirection operators, the single and double greater than symbols on the command line. One greater than operator redirects the output of the command on the left hand side to the file on the right hand side and completely removes anything else in the file. Whereas the double greater than operator will append the contents to the file, keeping whatever is already in there. Although misusing the output redirection operators can cause an inconvenience, another Git related problem, which is likely to cause huge hair loss for new developers, is not being able to exit Vi. This problem is so common, it's become a bit cliche, and you probably have seen memes about it when reading various blog posts. But for a new developer, the struggle is real. You've done a git commit or merge, and you've been whisked away from completing your command into some strange environment. Vi is just a text editor though, and knowing how to exit it in these situations is just one of those things you'll need to learn. If you find yourself in this situation, here's how you exit Vi. Press the escape key to enter what is known as normal mode, and type colon Q to quit, and then hit enter. So now you know how to exit the text editor via your life is complete and you can successfully commit your code and complete your project. Of course, a much more straightforward text editor is Visual Studio Code, and it's quite handy to open this directly from your command prompt when you're running other commands. As your experience on the command line grows, you'll probably find yourself setting up your projects directly on the command line using make dir or similar to get started. And then you'll probably want to dive straight into VS Code to start coding. 
new developers may not know how to or be able to open VS Code from the command line. To open the current folder in Visual Studio Code, this should just be a simple command on the command line. But if you've installed a different shell or its path isn't configured correctly, you might get a not found error or similar. To fix this, VS Code actually gives us a way to ensure your environment is set up correctly. If you open the command palette using view command palette and type shell command and select the shell command install code command in path command, you will be able to then run Visual Studio Code from your terminal. You might need to restart your command prompt to see the results, but once this is done, you will be able to open Visual Studio Code directly from your command prompt. Once you've started to work on different projects, you're most likely going to be running Node.js in some way to either build your front-end code or create Node-based APIs. Whilst a lot of tutorials will recommend installing Node.js directly from their website with one of their release packages, it can quickly become out of date, as the release cycle for Node.js is quite frequent. This isn't much of a problem if you're learning to code because you can just install the latest version of Node.js, but when you start working professionally, you'll understand that you may have the need to switch back to older versions of Node.js to diagnose problems with old code or work out why a project is building in one environment and not another. So the solution here is to make sure you can manage your Node.js installations using MVM, the Node Version Manager. This will enable you to get multiple Node.js versions installed on your local machine and switch between them easily. You can get MVM installed by following the instructions on their GitHub repository and Windows users, don't fear, there is an MVM for you too. Once installed, it's simply a case of installing the version of Node.js that you need and you can install as many different versions as you need and you can switch easily at any time by using MVM Use. Talking about environments, one last mistake new developers make is connecting to their services using the root user all the time. First of all, if you're a new developer and you're running your own private server, then absolutely fair play to you. I have a lot of respect for you. It's not that running your own server for your projects is better or in any way sensible, but there is so much you can learn from doing this. From learning how to use the protocols to connect to the server, the tools you need to host your apps and how to continuously update your projects, there are so many skills you can pick up which are incredibly useful for your career. But if you're going to run your own server, you should be mindful of security. And one of the most common mistakes new developers make is to log into their server as the root user all the time. The problem with this mainly is that you don't want to be logged in as the root user to your server and accidentally update or delete something you didn't mean to, but also having escalated privileges in your session increases the risk of malicious things from happening to your environment. The solution to this, of course, is to create your own user account and use this to access your server. This way you can limit the bad stuff other people and you can do when remotely logged on. To create a new user, you can use the user add command. The dash M option just makes sure the user has a home directory created when creating the account. And then what you'll want to do is set a new password using the password command. An extra tip here as well is you'll probably want to add the user to the sudo list so that they can perform some tasks with elevated privileges and you can do that using the user mod command. Of course, all of this is only possible if you still have some kind of access to your remote server. So here's one little extra mistake that new developers who are brave enough to run their own servers can sometimes make, and that is losing root access to their server. This can feel a bit final, you can't log in with any of your non-root accounts and for whatever reason your root password or SSH key is no longer working. You might be tempted at this point to delete your server and just start again, but of course that will mean losing all of your data. But all is not lost, before you get to that point you might want to see if your provider has the option for you to put your server into recovery mode which will enable you to reset your root account and allow you to regain access. If you want to see detailed instructions on how to do this, then check out this next tutorial where I'll show you how to recover root user access on a digital ocean droplet. But that's 12 mistakes that new developers make on the command line and how to fix them. Thanks very much for watching and keep on coding.